Hey everybody, welcome back to the Modern Customer Podcast. I'm your host, Blake Morgan. Today my guest is Sheila McGee-Smith. Sheila is a renowned contact center analyst that's been in the industry for 35 years. Today we are looking at what actually is a customer experience technology stack, what is the future of the contact center, and what's happening with AI in the contact center. We are distilling all of that AI information down to just what you need to know about the contact center. Please enjoy Sheila McGee-Smith. Sheila, welcome to the Modern Customer Podcast. It's so nice to see you here today, and I just love that we accidentally match. It's awesome. Purple's a great color. It is. It's a great color. Um, We've sort of known each other for many years. I mean, I've been following you for a long, long time, and I'm sure my audience are familiar with you. They see your face. um, You do a lot of speaking and content. So let's just go back to the beginning for my audience that don't know your story. How did you come upon the contact center world? Uh, So interestingly, um, out of business school, I went straight to AT&T. And I was initially in um, a sort of, like sort of technical support role. Then I became an account executive. Then I uh, moved into market research for about five years. So that was great grounding to be at a firm as big as AT and T, and to be able to do really high level market research. Um, I then got married, and you know this story. Um, my husband came home one day and said guess what? I got promoted. We're moving to Dallas. Uh, So I became a trailing spouse. Um, And I just had the opportunity um, once we moved to Texas from New Jersey to um, a firm was starting up an analyst relations, an an analyst house, um, a colleague. And the first report I did had nothing to do with contact centers. The second report I did was ACDs in the 90s, and it came Mm -hmm. out in 1990, and I have been following Contact Center full-time ever since. So I worked for an adult house for about 10 years, doing market share and, you know, reviewing products, and then I went independent in 2000, and uh, it's been a good path. So I think what's so exciting about the last 30 years is just been the progress in technology that now we can just provide better services to customers. You've seen it all. You are on the ground studying this technology. You really know what's happening. Sheila, do you think that the contact center industry is more exciting now than it has been in the past? And if you think it's more exciting, why? Sure. So as as I said, I've been covering it for almost 35 years now. And I think there are two things that have driven changes over that period. One is new challenges coming from customers and then new technologies coming in to help meet those challenges, right? So there was a long period where, you know, consumer technology was ahead of uh, what was happening in the contact center, right? And a lot of that was driven by the smartphone. Suddenly, you know, consumers could text and send pictures and contact centers couldn't, right? And so we ended up playing catch up um, and right into the pandemic, I think, um, is when that happened. And that, you know, that we really as a contact center really embraced all the digital channels that consumers wanted to use. Now, obviously, we have artificial intelligence as as a new technology, um, but I think it's being driven a little bit more from the business side, right? to create efficiencies and ultimately cost savings. And in the short term, you know, I think we have to bring consumers along and educate them a little bit on how uh, AI is not scary and AI is not going to invade their privacy. So I think there's exciting efficiencies that can be gained for companies who run contact centers. But I think we have some, a road to, to bring consumers along with us sometimes. Sheila, you mentioned ACD, um, called distribution software. I mean, let's just start at the beginning or the, the basics for our audience. Like, what is a customer experience technology stack when you think about the contact center? You know, it's really changed over the last five to 10 years, 
right? 10 years ago, everything was server-based, on-premises. Companies had to run those themselves. There's really been a very big shift to cloud-based contact center technologies um, in, in a good way. There's a whole lot of, you know, um, heavy lifting of taking care of equipment that contact centers don't have to worry about anymore, okay? The other thing that's happened, even as we've moved to the cloud more recently, um, we've moved to hyper clouds, right? To AWS, Google Cloud, Microsoft Azure. And that has increased the scalability of cloud-based contact centers, the reliability, the global reach. So whereas five years ago, smaller contact centers were very easily moving to the cloud up to about 100 seats. Today, we see enterprises with tens of thousands of contact center seats making the shift to cloud-based contact center. I mean, some of the biggest that you can think of. Right. Yeah. And that's a game changer just because of it's easy to set up shop, right? It's just everything yep. is easier. Um, you work with so many different vendors. And I think for people, for practitioners especially, all the vendors, it, it can just be very confusing. I mean, do you have a way that you categorize all your clients and all the vendors into different categories? Would you be able to break that down? So it's interesting. It actually ties to your last question about the technology stack. In the past, we would have contact center software that did essentially three things. It queued calls that were coming in, so people would wait in line, you know, virtual lines. Queued, it reported on those, and it gave analysis on those, right? So, you know, routing, queuing, and reporting is what contact center did. And then there was a whole other class of software that worked on workforce engagement management. Things like, how do I schedule agents? How do I train agents? And one of the things that's happening, again, as I said, tying back to the technology stack, is once we move to the cloud, both of these types of software have come together. So it really started when NICE acquired in contact. So NICE was very workforce engagement management in contact, was a, a leader in cloud contact center. And when they brought those two together, they really created a new way of thinking about the technology stack for customer experience. And why did that come together? Why did those two things come together? When you think about it, let's say, you know, an agent gets a call and they don't do really well, right? And it's not evaluated well by their supervisor. And it's also not a happy, you know, customer service uh, score from the consumer, right? So in the past, we'd have to take that data and send it somewhere to, you know, a different team that worked on workforce engagement management and say, you know, maybe this person needs some training. Today, with these things tied together, a couple of things can happen. The contact center can automatically take that agent out of groups that handle those kind of calls. So let's say it's a, a particular kind of technical call and they didn't do too well. So number one, let's not route any of those calls to them anymore. But number two, let's send them some just-in-time training, right? Let's take them off the line, perhaps, when things slow down, send them a one-hour module on that particular thing that they didn't quite get, have them do that, have them be tested on that, and then once they're up to speed on that new technology or that new, you know, kind of technical question, then put them back into the into the routing queue so they get those kind of calls again. Mm -hmm. So tying together how we manage the agents with how we manage the calls just makes more sense. You mentioned calls a lot. I mean, how much of your work is helping vendors and clients understand the digital customer service ah. that they need to be offering? So it's interesting that you talk about the digital engagement, because you're right, I do say calls a lot. But for many years, even though email was available and chat was available and, and messaging was available, we didn't see a big proportion of interactions. Let's call them that instead of calls. We didn't see a big proportion of interactions moving to those digital channels. One of the big game changers was the pandemic. People got used to 
doing a lot of things remotely, doing a lot of things with their digital phones and their digital capabilities. Um, and so, you know, if you looked five years ago, you would see over 90% of all of the interactions coming into contact centers were still voice. If you were to look today, that's dropped to about 70%. So that's a big change in a few years where 20% of interactions, people don't pick up the phone the same way, you know, and I'm sure you're like I am, right? Um, yesterday, I did a whole interaction with a, with a company over chat because I mm -hmm. could do things in between while they were looking things up and, you know, getting approvals to do certain things. And it's better use of my time than sitting on a phone. So there has definitely been a shift to digital. And to your point, companies are still um, figuring out how do we best do that. And it's going to vary, right? It's going to be vary by who is, what does your customer look like? If your customer is a lot of under 30 people, under 30 years old, you're going to see a larger proportion of that traffic going digital. If it, on the other hand, you know, you're doing Medicare hospital insurance claims, you're going to see fewer of those. So depending on what business you're in and what your audience looks like will really, you know, drive which of these is, is, is a bigger proportion of the traffic coming into your contact center. Yeah, absolutely. I've been tracking that too. I was looking at a report from NTT data about uh, the, just the rise in, in chat and in mm -hmm. chatbots and self-service in, in a few different gen, um, age groups. So, and I personally, I'm with you. Like I hate calling. I had to call this morning. My dog, her heart murmur, she's a heart murmur. She's old. The medicine is out. And it's like, I'm calling the vet to see if I can get that medicine today. And she's barking in the background. It's loud. It's chaotic. <laughs> like much rather do a text. There's, it's much smoother. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk about money. Let's talk about the investments that are being poured in. I mean, it's hard for some of us to imagine the amount of money that's poured into customer service. Uh -huh. Can we follow the money with you, Sheila? Where is the contact center money going today? So interestingly, um, ever since the pandemic, there has been a shift to more investment into things that support agents, right? Things that make engage agents more in the work that they do, uh, give them more freedom to schedule the way they want to schedule, allow them to work from home. So part of that has just been more companies moving to the cloud, to cloud contact center, because you can support a work from home workforce much more easily if you're in the cloud, right? It's possible from premises-based servers, but it's a lot more, you know, tricky. Um, and so there's been investment in that, you know, let's move to the cloud for lots of reasons, but one of them to support agents more. Um, how do we train agents who are remote? How do we schedule agents who want to have almost like a gig kind of a job, like an Uber kind of a job? Right? right. I want to yeah. be able to, you know, work from nine to noon and then take four hours off and then go come back at seven o'clock and work for, you know, five more hours and do a right. full day's work, but do it on my terms. Right. So, you know, in terms of training, recruiting, you know, there's a lot of uh, money being spent on recruiting as well. Um, so there's, a, you know, if we move to the AI topic, which I'm sure we're going to come to. Um, when we look at age, um, uh, artificial intelligence in the contact center, there's really two ways you can go, right? One is, at least initially, is to automate interactions, right? To your point earlier, let's use a chat bot or a text, you know, a voice bot to completely automate so that a call, an interaction never has to, cut, to touch a live agent, okay? The other way we can go is, how do we help agents perform their jobs more efficiently so that we still get cost savings and we still get shorter hold times where a company, a customer is on the phone less time or in a chat less time because we're helping the agent, okay? So that's called agent assist. 
And agent yeah. assist is really the first way people are deploying artificial intelligence. And I'm going to stop and let you take this where you want to go, because I could just sit here and talk about this all day. <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I always use the example of when you have to change your flight and you go to the ticket gate agent, and if it's taking a long time, that's because often the ticket gate agent, in the past at least, had to call a call center, and there were just so many um, hindering blocks in front of the experience of the employee. And so AI and agent assist, like you said, promises to just direct the agent. I've heard it described as like ways navigation for agents. So that's exciting. Um, let's talk about the last two years. I mean, there's just been a lot of change in our industry, 2023 versus 2024. As we think about AI, like what are some of the advances that we've seen in the last six months that are, are different than we saw at the beginning of 2023? So 2023 is sort of a harbinger point in time because that's when we all really became aware of generative AI. And I mean both technology vendors and technology consultants like you and I, but also consumers suddenly became aware of this next generation of artificial intelligence, which promised much more conversational customer support. So I think in 23, it, there were really two applications that were being deployed most quickly. And that was summarization, where at the end of a call, generative AI could look at the entire transcript of the conversation, figure out what the action items were, what are the key points, what are the you know what was the intent of the consumer, did they get what they wanted, and to do that in seconds, literally two seconds, instead of an agent sitting there after the call trying to give a detailed look at what happened so that the next agent could have some idea. So the first thing was summarization. The next was automation, right? What, you know, I, I like to compare it to the IVR. When the IVR first came out, and it was just in the, you know, the 90s that it came out, it was able to automate about 5% of interactions that were coming wow. into contact centers, right? You know, things like, did my check clear? What's my balance? You know, what hours are you open? That kind of thing. The promise of automation using AI is that we can take that 5% and maybe move it to 20% or maybe even move it to 40% depending on the specific thing that the consumer is trying to do. Now, there's still a lot of things that consumers need people to help them with. I mean, again, like me, you probably call the contact center when you know it's not an easy answer, that somebody Absolutely. has to make a judgment call, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And so there are times when we're going to continue to need human agents for the empathy that they bring to calls, to the understanding that, you know, even artificial intelligence can't do. But what's different this year, so that was year one, you know, ground zero, year 23 after generative AI summarization and automation through chatbots or voice bots. What we're looking at in 24 is really expanding the number of solutions that are available. And it's going from just automating very simple things or helping an agent to a, the next step of actually completing tasks, right? So an agent might now get uh, information on what's the next best thing to do for this customer that I have on the phone. And let's say it is, let's send them information on this new insurance policy that they want to sit back and learn a little bit more about. So instead of the agent sending that to some back office team, having it, you know, go into a CRM that has to be picked out later, no having AI actually complete the task, send it, almost like software to software instead of people to people. And so, the, you know, I've heard Salesforce, uh, Ryan Nichols, who is the, uh, the SVP of product management for the service cloud at Salesforce, has said, we're going to move from large language models, which is what generative AI is, it handles language really well, 
to large action models. And so 24, we're tr sort of testing the limits on that. How much, what kinds of tasks can AI totally complete? And what kind of integration of software do we need in order to let that happen? Yeah, so Sheila, speaking of integration of software, I think for practitioners, at least when I go to conferences and I meet people, the practitioners are there to learn because the landscape can be overwhelming. They're looking for use cases. They're looking for ideas. Do you have any advice for how practic practitioners should begin to think about bringing AI into their contact center? I do, and it's interesting. that This is an often used phrase in financial markets that you can't time the market. Okay. It'd be great if we could all buy low and sell high, but even the most successful Wall Street arbitrageurs make mistakes and, and they lose big from time to time. I can compare that to when is the best time to deploy innovation in your business? Yes, AI is going to continue to change, but waiting for change to stop is like trying to time the market. It's an impossible task. So when I talk to businesses, my advice to them is to start small with a proof of concept or a trial. It's interesting, you know, five years ago, people would buy new solutions based on a return on investment calculation, right? I mean, that was the sort of the standard way. A salesman would give you this and say, we will pay, you know, this solution will pay back in 14 months. You know, you're going to spend a million, but, you know, you're going to get that back in 14 months or whatever the, the number was. Now it's moved much more to show me that this is going to work in my business with my customers. So most of the vendors in this space are very supportive of starting with a proof of concept or there's a lot of free trials out there and really evaluate the outcome of artificial intelligence in your business. And who should you go to? Again, it's, it's, it's a sort of an easy answer, but I always think it's the right one. Your current vendor is proud, you know, more than likely has these new solutions or has, is working with partners that offer those solutions with the system you have in place. So you don't have to throw everything away to get started with some of this innovative technology. Even if you're not in the cloud, there are ways to start using artificial intelligence and trialing it and testing it in your business. So one of the things that we're finding that, that businesses find out is we, we do a test and we put in, let's say, a voice bot and we put it in for a very specific use case. And what happens is it very quickly, companies start thinking, okay, if it worked here, we could do it over here. Wait a minute, this business over here within our company could also use it. So it's like this start small and grow within your business, I think is the, is the, the key to getting started. Mm -hmm. I think that's good advice. Just like anything in life, just take at least some risk a little bit and see how mm -hmm. it goes and then reiterate. Um, we're getting toward the end of our time together, Sheila. Let's talk about the future, the future of the contact center. There are predictions, obviously, that there will be no people. It'll be fully automated, fully AI. And what do you think, Sheila, the contact center of the future looks like? Are there more people, less people? There are about 15 million people who work as agents in the world today, right? And I think in five years, we'll have fewer. I don't think we'll have half as many. I don't think they'll all be gone. What I think is we'll probably have 12,000. That 20% of agent work... You mean 12 million. Right, I'm sorry. To, yeah, 12 million. Um, that 20% over five years may you know, move on to different kind of jobs. And, and note that I'm not saying that agents will lose their jobs. There are new kind of jobs that come out of um, artificial intelligence. To just to name one, it's knowledge management, right? It's becoming more important. How do we give that information to an agent? How do we curate the information that we want to show to that agent? We need people in the middle of that, people who know the business, know the products, know the customers. So I think for the first time, we may be in a position to actually have a better career path for agents 
than we've ever had before. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's so much opportunity right there too with every company wants to cross sell and upsell, but they're not even getting the basics right. So maybe there's an opportunity there. If they do the basics better, they can be more creative. They can do personalization and sales. So I love that. And I think I like your numbers. I think that does make sense. Like we'll still have agents. They'll just be a little bit less and they'll be redeployed. Let's uh, move on to get to know you a little bit better outside of your work. You ready to take some rapid fire questions? Absolutely. All right, Sheila, number one, what's the most important part of your morning routine? Ooh, interesting. Having a cup of coffee. Uh, that's my, my go-to, first thing. Go, go get Amen. some coffee. Amen to that. And then in contrast, what do you do to relax at the end of a hectic day? So I am a big believer in something called the Calm app. So there's an app that's a, a sort of, if you're familiar with it, a mind, a mind mindfulness kind of app. And actually one of the vendors, Genesis, um, offered a, a subscription to some of the analysts for a year. And I have since, you know, really gotten in tune with, you know, turning things off, just listening to the app. And I find it's a very peaceful, tur- you know, calm down for the day and helps me get to sleep. Yeah. All right. Very cool. And then what show are you currently streaming right now? Ah, so um, A Gentleman in Moscow. So it was a fabulous book three or four years ago. And um, uh, Ewan McGregor uh, is doing the title role in an eight-part episode uh, on Showtime. And I am loving it. You know, I, I have to sort of limit myself to one per night, you know, right. I, 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 can't, I can't, you know, I don't have the luxury to sit there and, and watch five or six, but I'm really enjoying it and savoring it. What's your idea of perfect happiness? Ooh, perfect happiness. You know, I, I've been working this way, the way we work, remote, working with people I want, I like to work with. To me, I, I'm, I have found that perfect happiness, right? I, I, I do the kind of things that I want to do. I do it with people that I, that I enjoy working with. Um, I travel quite a bit, but it's like going to visit friends. You know, even mm-hmm. like every year for the last few years, I go to London for two weeks and I visit with all of the contact center vendors in their London offices to see what's different there. You know, what how are uh, technologies being adopted in Europe versus in the U.S.? What can we learn from what they're doing? And to me, that's like a vacation. <laughs> okay. Well, actually, do that's my I next do. question. So yeah. what's your favorite type of vacation? Maybe you already answered that. Well, not really. So I don't have children, but I have 13 nieces and nephews. And when each of them hit 10 years old, I took them on an anti maim trip. So the most recent one was last summer. I had a niece, because because of the pandemic, she was 12, but we went to Tokyo because I have a brother who lives in Tokyo and she'd never even really met him. We spent a week in Tokyo. Then we went to Hawaii for a week and just spending time with her, letting her learn things about different countries and different cultures, you know, and doing things that she'd never done before um, is a great vacation for me. And I've done it a number of times. That is awesome. Love that. If you could have lunch with anyone dead or alive, who would it be? It's funny. The first thing that comes to mind um, is B.F. Skinner. Um, I was a psych major in college and he was the founding father of behaviorism which I, feel, I still think um, has great concepts for some of the work that we do, consumers, and he was just a brilliant mind. So it's, it's an odd one. You're not going to get a lot of people saying be a winner, <laughs> Never. but that's no. the first thing that came to my mind. Okay, cool. And lastly, if you had to describe your outlook in one quick motto, what would it be? Uh, I'm a native New Yorker, you know? And, and that, right. that says a lot about who I am and how I live my life. 
That's awesome. Well, very cool. Well, Sheila, this has been so fun. I hope to see you soon out there um, at events, and I really hope you'll come back and, and continue to share your, your thoughts with us, and I really appreciate you being here. Excellent. Great to spend some time with you, Blake. Everybody, you've been tuning into the Modern Customer Podcast. Until next time. Don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel or follow me on social media, including Instagram, LinkedIn, X, and more. Thank you.